So you are not in Tianjin. You are now a free man, right? <laughs> no, I'm free man. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in the ball. Uh, so I, I think I, I'll start the um, the uh, side event. My colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning in New York, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening in Asia. So this is the SDI Forum 2022 side event. Open science promoted quality graduate education in Global South. So my name is Wei Yang, the moderator of this side event. Uh, I was the former president of Zhejiang University, where this event is virtually hosted. I'm also the present chair of CCOS, treasurer and the UNESCO representative of TWAS, advisor of Springer Nature, and the chair of uh, CSA DGE. Uh, today is the 4th of May. Uh, in China, we call it the, the day of youth for the young people. And uh, today we have four focus points related to the topic of the side events. Uh, the, these focus points are first transformative effects of open science to address pressing challenges of graduate education in global south, especially under pandemic situation. Number two is the role of international multi-stakeholders in preparing graduates from developing countries with the required qualities to become researchers nourished by open science. And three, the best practices of current future collaborative models for quality graduate education in global south, especially for women. And number four, a global effort for providing inclusive and affordable open data for global south. So this aspect will be addressed by our six distinguished speakers today. So our first speaker, uh, Her Excellency, is Shamila Nair Badole, the UNESCO Assistant Director General for the Natural Science. Shamila engaged an active and unique role on advancing open science. Today, he will talk about the issue of UNESCO campaign on open science with the focus on the impact on quality education and the gender equality. So each speaker has a time of about 10 minutes. So Shamila, is your floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tiang. It's a great pleasure here uh, to be with you here today. On behalf of UNESCO, I address you here today and sincerely thank the organizers, UNDESA, Zhejiang University, China Association for Science and Technology, and the Chinese, uh, the Association of Chinese Graduate Education. I thank you very much on behalf of UNESCO for inviting us to share with you here today. Dear Professor Wei Heng, Chairman of CCOS, distinguished speakers on this panel today, ladies and gentlemen, quality education and open science are inseparable and the relationship is reciprocal. Open science aims to provide the access to science and scientific advancements to everyone, everywhere, 
and quality education enables people to develop and contribute to open science. What better way then to share this day with you here today on the Day of Youth? We need to nurture our qualified experts and young scientists and youth with the state of the art educational methods, technology and knowledge in order for them to shape sustainable societies with inclusive science. Now, specifically on the open science, I would like to share with you UNESCO's role. Since 75 years on, UNESCO strengthens the link between science and society to increase the impact of science. And this is the spirit of open science. The students, the young graduates who practice and benefit from open science and open educational resources will be most prepared for identifying the needs of societies and for developing inclusive and sustainable solutions through high quality, transparent, reliable, and collaborative scientific work. By benefiting from open science, students become aware of the importance and the means of open and responsible sharing of scientific knowledge. They can then meaningfully and efficiently contribute to building the future of science, technology, and innovation, and the future we want. Open science has the potential to increase the visibility of the work of scientists in the global south, especially the work of early career researchers and women. Open science will enable the inclusion of knowledge from marginalized researchers and will lead to the creation of solutions that benefit a wider range of societal stakeholders. Dear participants, dear experts with us here today, the transition to open science requires a common understanding of benefits and challenges, the different parts that different groups of stakeholders in different regions of the world need to undertake to put the principles of open science in practice. Open science requires enabling policy environments and standards at different levels from institutional to national to regional and international. Open science requires awareness raising, education, investment, and international and interdisciplinary collaboration. And if done right, open science can be the powerful engine to bridge the science, technology, and innovation gaps between and within countries and fulfill the human right to science as indicated in Article 27 of the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights. This is why UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, since 75 years is promoting the spirit of open science. And some three years ago, UNESCO embarked on a global multi-stakeholder transparent consultation process to develop an international standard setting instrument on open science in the form of a UNESCO recommendation. And last year, in November 2021, the 193 member states of UNESCO adopted the UNESCO recommendation on open science. This recommendation, a global recommendation, provides the commonly defined definition of open science, which it builds on four key pillars, open scientific knowledge, open science infrastructures, open engagement of societal actors and open dialogue with other knowledge systems. Dear participants, to ensure that the benefits of open science are shared and reciprocal and do not involve unfair, unequitable extraction of data and knowledge or unintended consequences, such as extension of privilege and widening the technological and knowledge gaps, the recommendation spells out the core values of open science quality, integrity of science, collective benefits, potential of ensuring equity among researchers from developed and developing countries and enabling fair and reciprocal sharing of scientific inputs and outputs. Now, open science also requires investments in capacity building and human resources and training, transforming the scientific practice to adapt to the challenges, opportunities and risks of the 21st century digital era. But this requires research, education and training in new skills required for new technologies. And UNESCO will accompany all of its 193 member states to implement this unique recommendation on open science. Specifically on quality, higher education and scientific research, I would like to indicate here that a core set of science data and data stewardship skills skills related to intellectual property law, as well as skills needed to ensure open access and engagement with society should be incorporated into higher education research skills curricula. 
Now, universities and research institutions play a key role in building a culture and aligning the incentives for open science by removing the barriers related to research and career um, development, career evaluation. The increased cost for scientists and high article publishing charges associated with certain business models in scientific publishing may be a cause of inequality for scientific communities around the world, and especially for those from the South. This is indeed a barrier. So different stakeholders, including research funders, universities, publishers, editors, who are online with us here today, should join the efforts to recognize researchers for sharing, collaborating, and engaging with society. And I call all upon you to support early career researchers to drive this cultural change towards open science. We must ensure diversity in scholarly communications. We must ensure diversity in a transparent and equitable access. And I, I think this is one of really the ways towards open science. Open science demands innovative approaches in the entire research cycle from formulation of hypothesis, development and testing of methods to analysis, reflection, but also to sharing and confrontation of ideas and results, uptake and reuse, how then can we ensure open science and higher education if the majority are left behind? We must extend the principles of openness in all stages of the scientific process to improve quality, reproducibility, and accelerate dissemination and growth of scientific knowledge. And this is the scientific humanism, which is at the heart of all our work. Last but not least, Universities and higher education institutes can play a key role to support creation and maintenance of effective international multi-stakeholder collaborative networks to exchange best practices and lessons learned in open science. To conclude, Mr. Moderator, Professor Hyang, I want to remind us all here that over the last years, digitization has opened the transition to open science. In the last two years, COVID has helped us to better acknowledge the need for open science, while scientists, publishers, funders, decision makers have proved that the joint effort of sharing science for the good of humanity can help us rise beyond this pandemic. But we must remember that open science can be efficient and will only pay back when it's operationalized equitably. I'm glad that the potential of open science in promoting quality graduate education especially in the global south is acknowledged. I thank you all very much for promoting the open science principles and ensuring that no one is left behind and no scientist is left behind. I thank you very much and look forward to this dialogue with you. Professor Hyang, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's a very, uh, uh, very well, uh, very uh, inventing, uh, convincing uh, speech for the history, the current status, and the old aspect of open science. So uh, the plan is we will first let three speakers to, to speak, then we have a very short uh, Q&A session, then, then for the next three, okay. And uh, we move to the uh, second speaker and uh, he is also my good friend and a colleague, uh, Dr. Romain Marenzi, uh, Executive Officer of the World Academy of Science, known as TWAS. Uh, besides science, Dr. Marenzi is also a very experienced uh, in institutional, national, and international levels of quality education. So quality education is one of the SDG uh, target, a uh, uh, goal uh, we try to address uh, today. And uh, he will bring with us uh, a presentation on the pilot programs, uh, graduate education and the South to South collaboration. So Dr. Marenzi, please. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, and again, um, my name is Rome Murenzi, and I'm the executive director of UNESCO TWAS, the World Academy of Science for the Advancement of Science in the Developing World, a UNESCO program, unit based in Trieste in Italy. 
Uh, quality education holds a fundamental role in reaching sustainable development goals in developing countries. The promotion of open science in particular, which is a, a large focus of today's panel, provides us with new possibilities for exchanging best practices, sharing our experience in innovative activities in both graduate education in South-South collaboration. Most importantly, it brings key stakeholders together to keep enhancing a culture of collaboration, one where we can work in unison towards scale up graduate education for developing countries. We are here today because we all recognize that open science is increasingly recognized as a critical accelerator for the advancement of, of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It really is a game changer in, bringing, in bridging the science, technology, innovation gaps and fulfilling the human right to science. You see the potential of open science to address pressing challenges of graduate education in Global South is truly enormous. Because of the UNESCO TWAS mission is focused on building scientific capacity in the developing world, we and I personally are deeply committed to tackle these issues. As an academy, TWAS has uh, almost 1,300 elected fellows from more than 100 countries. 11 of them are Nobel laureate, about 84% of TWAS fellows come from developing nations and are the most the world's most accomplished scientists and engineers. As many of you know, TWAS also implement a range of capacity building programs to advance science in the developing world. Many of these programs have a focus on South-South collaboration. They include fellowship, fellowship for PhD, postdoctoral, fellowship research grant, exchange programs and prizes. The support that TWAS provides for science scientists in the developing countries of, is of critical importance, in particular given of the emphasis that TWAS programs place on young researchers. We hope that to build a strong generation of future scientists and future leaders for the Global South. As mentioned by Shamila, the process of um, uh, focusing on the early career. For example, TWAS established the TWAS Young Affiliate Network and through the links created this program, click collaborations have arisen on novel interdisciplinary project. The largest and longest standing capacity building program at WAS is the research grant program, which comprises grants for individual scientists as well as more established scientists who lead a research group. The latter scheme also includes funding for training, master's degree student, which is a strong education and skill, skill building program. This complements other TWAS programs such as the PhD fellowship program, which functions thanks to the invaluable support of program partners in emerging economies. Importantly, because we are guided by Agenda 2030, we have developed a host of additional programs that we run to complement our capacity building effort. Among these, a flagship project focused on science diplomacy as a tool to ease the resolution of global problems, bridging to, bringing together young scientists and policymakers from the global south. Another related project focus, focuses on refugee and displaced scientists whose scientific careers, careers must be supported to ensure the preservation of science, which alongside, alongside leaving no one behind is one of the key objectives in our Science in Exile initiative. This leads me to a key concern for TWAS and a fundamental issue in any South-South programming to avoidance the brain drain. You see, the academic, mobility, the academic mobility is a wonderful and necessary achievement for scientists. For scientists. We support it for this reason. TWAS runs a number of change in the academic mobility programs that are a key opportunity we offer. Yes, yet we also know that that is a system back home. We are, are not in, enhanced. Few of the scientists will we, we return home after their, ex, their experience abroad. This is why many of our programs have a, succeed, a significant element of capacity building towards institutions and not only individuals. The experience of TWAS in past decades has also shown us the key aspect of successful programs run by TWAS entails responsiveness 
to the need of developing countries themselves, which is why programs like TIAN bring together the best of young scientists from around the world. We have also learned that building such truly collaborative model for capacity building and graduate education in the global south, especially for women graduates, requires meaningful relationship with actors on the ground, which is something that we do alongside regional partners. When we link, we think of quality education in the global south, we must also remember that science literacy has a fundamental role to uh, to realize the full benefit of, of STI building in a wider society. The pandemic has shown us just how important this is. In fact, as uh, I wrote an editorial in the TWAST newsletter on the importance of science for all people, if people do not understand the basic science of germs, they will be less likely to wash their hands. The same can be said of climate change. Resilience to its impact is closely linked to an appreciation of the scientific dynamics that underpin it. For the public at large, climate is an, idea, is an ideal interdisciplinary thing for lifelong learning about scientific progress that touches us all, and an appreciation of the ways in which human affects are affected with, by the Earth systems. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like just to conclude by saying that, uh, uh, to conclude, let me say that open science really has the potential of making scientific progress more transparent and to making it more inclusive and democratic. It is this inclusiveness that I think is fundamental for the, at the attainment of SDGs and Agenda 2030. The UNESCO recommendation of open science has been a key step in this respect. The efforts of open science to address pressing challenges of graduate education in the global south can be truly transformative. We now need to prove that we, can, we are up to the task. Thank you. Roman, for your uh, stimulating uh, speech. And uh, also thank you to, to bring the, the point of uh, quality graduate education and also the South-to-South -South, uh, collaboration. And we'll uh, back to this issue during our uh, panel uh, discussion later on. So the, uh, our next speaker is the, a charming lady and the Professor Lian Zhenghe, uh, she is also my colleague at the Zhejiang University. But she is the Vice President of uh, Zhejiang University for International Collaboration. And the title of her speech is The Path Forward, The Future of Graduate Education Cooperation in the Global so, maybe you can share the yeah, screen. The screen, right. Okay. Thank you, Professor Yang. Okay. Your Excellencies, Honorable Presidents, colleagues, and friends, it is a great pleasure to be here today and meet you all virtually. I'm happy to be part of today's meaningful conversation on topics of graduate education in Global South. Investing in education is the most cost-effective way to drive economic development, improve skills and opportunities for young people, as well as unlock progress on all 17 sustainable development goals. Graduate education has become more important and necessary than ever, as it brings a lot of prep benefits to the individuals and to the society as a whole. With the world moving increasingly forward towards a knowledge economy, tertiary education can help economists keep up or catch up with more technologically advanced societies. According to the recent World Report by Toronto-based Higher Education Strategy Associates, titled World Higher Education, institutions, students, and funding, 
the Global South is changing higher education. In detail, the global number of HEIs was approaching 90,000 in 2018, with over three quarters of these in the global. Oh, please open the microphone. Already close, Professor He. Is it right? Yeah, please go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Although this report said 56 countries. Sorry. Sorry for the noise. Although this report looks at 56 countries to establish a global picture based on a sample of over 90% of the global higher education system, it is possible to make generalizations about global trends based on much smaller samples. In particular, just the three countries, China, the US, and India, together accounted for 47.7% percent of all four samples of 208.6 million students in 2018. These countries also contain 54 percent of the world's higher education institutions, though this is mostly due to India, which on its own accounts for 46 percent. Taking THE World University rankings as a reference, only 17 institutions from Global South are listed among the top 200. It is not surprising to see this. The improvement of tertiary education quality in China is also reflected in the ranking. However, none of the universities from other low-income countries appear in the league table, which indicates more emphasis on quality education is urgently needed for Global South. China is a global powerhouse in the sphere of international higher education. As part of the Belt and the Road Initiative, as well as the Double World Class Initiative, China has been investing in attracting international students, including significant national and the provincial scholarship programs. The number of international students in China has increased over the recent decades, from 77,000 in 2003 to about half a million in 2018, with an average annual growth rate of over 10%. In 2018, international students studying in China came from 192 countries and regions and studied in 1,004 Chinese higher education institutions. Half of those students were studying for a diploma, according to the Ministry of Education of China, 2020. China is currently the most prominent international student host country in Asia and the third study abroad destination in the world. For instance, China actively implemented multiple innovative projects to promote South-South cooperation between China and other developing countries. Since 2013, more than 4,300 people from developing countries have been funded to study for master's program or doctoral degrees in China. Some examples include the 20 plus 20 cooperation plan for Chinese and African institutions of higher education. The establishment of the Atomic Energy Scholarship Project, talented young scientists program under the Belt and the Road Initiative, and so on and so forth. Through these programs, China has strengthened the scientific research collaboration and exchange of visits between teachers and students with countries in Global South and the jointly cultivate high-level talents. As one of the leading universities in China, Zhejiang University actively participates in these endeavors. First, I'm happy to provide you with a brief overview of the university. As a member of the C9 League, ZGU ranked the third in China and the 45th worldwide. We are also a member of the nation's double first class initiative, 
which aims to build world-class universities and first-class disciplines. While seeking truth and pursuing innovation, we consider global engagement as priority. Currently, we have formed partnerships with more than 200 universities from 40 plus countries and regions across the six continents, setting up over 60 double degree programs and over 40 international joint labs and research centers. Over the past five years, ZGU has hosted hundreds of students from global South countries. In 2021 alone, around 400 students in LDCs studied on our campuses. Then I'd like to particularly introduce some programs that we have launched. First, the International Design Education Program is jointly implemented by the UN Technology Bank for the least developed countries, the World Eco Design Conference External Link, and the International School of Design at Zhejiang University. The cooperation aims to enhance the design education capacity of the LDC which offers great potential as a driver of innovation, problem solving, and economic growth. Second, the master program in innovation, entrepreneurship, and global leadership. Focusing on the leadership skills needed to successfully manage global business, the program is based on an action learning model in which the students will get access to business consulting projects from excellent corporate partners. It offers the students great opportunities to dialogue with the most influential entrepreneurs and executives from famous Chinese companies such as Alibaba, NetEase, and Becky. Third, the training program on poverty alleviation and the development for developing countries. To understand China's national conditions and the economic and the social development achievements, to introduce China's anti-poverty policies comprehensively, achievements, practices, and experiences to improve the practical skills of students in carrying out anti-poverty work in their own countries, to promote exchanges and make China's contribution to achieving the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This program has been around for nearly two decades, since 2004, and has trained 700 plus officials from 100 plus different countries and regions. Well, looking forward, I'd like to put forward two suggestions on how to strengthen and enhance our South-South collaboration in the domain of educating graduate students. The first idea that pops into my mind is to establish a high-level cooperation program between the Chinese Ministry of Education and TWAS, in which I suppose all the leading universities in China could be involved. The program could attract more talented students from various developing countries and provide students with scholarship to seek further education in China. It could also become a multilateral cooperation platform where interdisciplinary research could happen among distinctive researchers from different countries. Second, we should harness the technology to benefit education programs especially in such trying times. Information technology highlights the feasibility of studying online without restrictions from the pandemic and the physical distance. For example, as part of the Z4G action plan, the two-week global summer school is launched to inspire the young students to electrify the global community in response to the UN 2030 agenda. We welcome undergraduates and the graduate students all around the world. So far, over 50% of the student enrollment come from developing countries. So, looking ahead, changes can happen only by taking steps from now. We still have a lot to, of space to improve in promoting quality education, but we always believe that collaboration is the key. Well, this is the end of my presentation, and I look forward to listening to the other speakers during this live discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lu, for your uh, excellent presentation and a very good uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, now we come to the first
session of uh, our discussion, we already have uh, three uh, speakers who talk on the address on the issue we have uh, discussed in this uh, side events. So through the chat room of this, uh, uh, this, this meeting, we have collected several uh, questions. And uh, I would like first to uh, uh, convey two questions to uh, Shamila. So one is from uh, Professor uh, Ke Hong, and uh, he himself will uh, chair another side, side events tomorrow. And his question is, uh, what is the major barrier for Global South graduate education? To what extent can open science help? What concretely could and should be done for open science actors to help? So this is the first question. And there are also another question uh, which is related to the question uh, asked by Professor uh, Hong is, uh, what are different stakeholders' responsibility to contributing a trust science under open science trend? This also related with the integrity issues. So maybe, uh, Shamila, can you uh, answer uh, or talk on these two questions? Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Ray. These are difficult questions and uh, speaking under the banner of uh, UNESCO and my colleague, uh, Professor Roman Morenzi, I'm going to try to answer these from a very open, um, open dialogue that we have in here. I think uh, some of the major challenges facing uh, science scientists from the South is first of all, access to scientific data and information. If one looks at the large journals of the world and the high impact journals, they do not publish research from the South. And maybe that's a question I would like to put out to, to our publishers. Why is the science from the South not valorized? Why are high impact journals only publishing research from certain regions of the world? How to valorize the research from the South? So this is the first problem we are facing. And of course, the research from the South always focuses on the challenges that societies face in the South. How can we valorize that research? Because after all, it's based on the South's needs. So I think these are, these are major challenges that we are facing today in terms of publications. Then we have the high cost of publications. The southern countries cannot take the subscription to these high impact journals. They cost an arm and a leg. And the universities in the south struggle to have subscriptions to these journals. And having the subscription also means that they will be able to, of course, access these journals just in terms of the information, but doesn't give them any other access. Now, maybe I would say that and then going back to publishers, how can publishers have an open peer review evaluation where they also include reviewers from the South? I think it's enough to see these high impact journals. There are very few reviewers from the South. Now, I think I would like to say that I would like to make a proposal to all the high impact journals who are listening to us here today. And here's the challenge to promote open science and science from the South and an equal opportunities for scientists. I would like to lay out the challenge here to you today. Would it be possible to reserve at least one article per issue for scientists from the South? Give them a chance to publish in your journals. Reserve one article per month in the spirit of scientific solidarity and scientific humanism. Enable the scientists from the South to access your journals. So that's the first one. That's my first plea today. Yeah. Then I would like that 
we produce a set of indicators for each of the journals and to see how the journals are making their journals, their publication journals accessible to institutes in the South. We all know the cost of research today and research goes at the expense of public expenditure. All research is undertaken by uh, R&D and private sector. But the research which is published by the, by the public institution should be made available. So could we have a set of indicators for each journal so that the journal will be able to produce at the back of the journal how they are making available the scientific research published in the journal to institute in the South? How many scientists have access to these journals? Let's measure whether these scientific journals and scientific publishing houses can make science available. I think this is also something I would like to say, and that is also because science is so expensive. It's so critically expensive. Developing countries cannot afford to invest in science. And if they have access to this open scientific research and information, it will avoid duplications in investing in science. They can adapt it, accommodate it, and use it for the benefit of their societies and the rest of the South. So let's promote this North-South-South-South cooperation. And then I would go to one last part, and that is the language. It is difficult to access the scientific journals because of language, because English is known as the language of communication. So maybe I would call upon the journals to have maybe some training and webinars on scientific writing skills. Why not? So that their research can be explained and communicated to the rest of the world. Now, how can we continue to trust in science? I think this is the role also of all the scientists listening to us here today. Science can fuel and fire our imagination. Science is the spirit of humanity today. We need not only to unite behind the science, but we must promote science. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, very uh, uh, powerful answer. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one question for uh, Roman Maranzi is um, uh, what will be the largest impact for the South to South collaboration in graduate education? I remember you, you talked to me during your visit to China, the importance of uh, to have 1,000 PhD per year for the, for the global south, uh, for the least developing countries. Could you comment on that? Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. If you read the last uh, uh, UNESCO report, uh, it is very clear that we have uh, really, really challenges not only, as um, uh, Shamila just said, in, in terms of publications, but also in terms of teachers. Most of the university in the global south, actually in these developing countries, they have less than 20% of the teachers with a PhD. This means that actually somebody will be uh, teaching um, mathematics at the university with a bachelor's degree. Which, 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 which becomes a challenge. If somebody is in second year of university in mathematics and the person who's teaching him has a, barely has a, has a bachelor's degree or master's, it becomes a challenge. So this means that most universities actually in the, in the least developed countries, they are just improved secondary schools. So therefore, the capacity actually to support the training at the PhD level is very critical. So what uh, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, uh, Malaysia have done by providing this global support for the South-South Fellowship Program, this is a really a, an invaluable support actually to building a scientific capacity in the South, in particular 
to, to building quality quality education. Uh, around 2011, when I started, when this program started, when I arrived at was actually there were only 50 to 100 students doing PhD there and uh, working through UNESCO, through the member states, through um, Chinese Academy of Sciences and Brazil. We were able to increase that number actually now. We have more than 1,000 who are doing PhD in the South South uh, Fellowship Program. Uh, you did mention very, um, um, did mention the in the presentation, the United Nations Technology Bank in Gebze, that also has a, a very important role to play. Uh, so the UN also has a very important role to play in that. But uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, uh, Roman. Uh, to uh, to further go on this line, I would like to uh, ask the Professor He is um, because she talked about the also the uh, graduate education program of South to South collaboration. So, can you shed more details on the future cooperation concerning? the joint graduate program between China universities and the TWAS. Okay, thank you, Professor Yang. Yeah, TWAS is an educational and scientific organization representing scholars from developing countries, which will serve as a great bridge between Chinese universities and the developing countries to promote quality graduate education. And in fact, currently, we are working with the Ministry of Education in China and to us to set up a fellowship program, which is similar to the successful model between TWAS and other stakeholders. We are looking forward to having TWAS recommending outstanding students to pursue higher degrees in Chinese universities and to enhance their capacity building and make a contribution to their home countries. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So we, we, we now it's time for us to move on the second half of this uh, second event. Uh, Shamila asked uh, uh, a lot of questions on the uh, publications of the, the journal papers and so on. And our next speaker, uh, next speaker is the, is Mr. Yong Sai Chi, the chairman of Elsevier. And uh, he will speak on open science promoted online and hybrid quality education. Uh, Wes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yang Wei. Um, my longtime friend, <clears throat> it's been too long since we've shared a meal in Hangzhou or Beijing. I hope that I can soon visit China again. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to address the questions that was uh, posed since I made remarks, and I think I'll do that later on during the Q&A session. Uh, but before I delve into the open science uh, and how it can improve the graduate education global south, I'd like to share a short story that just shows you how impactful open science can be. And I'm not going to talk about what we will do. We'll talk about what we have actually been doing because I think rhetoric is entirely useless in this world today. In the summer of 2019, a man by the name of Dr. Pratush Shreta was on call at a small neurosurgery hospital in Kathmandu, Nepal, when paramedics wheeled in a patient in a critical state into his waiting room. The patient was a 20-year-old man named Karman Tamang, who was suffering a terrible accident at a construction site that left an iron rod lodged in his brain, paralyzing half of his body. Dr. Shrestha had never treated an injury this severe before, so he conducted a very rapid literature review and found an article about a similar case in India. Following the guidance in the article, Dr. Shrestha and an 11 member team of local doctors successfully completed the surgery and miraculously, Mr. Tamang fully recovered after just a few weeks. Now, <clears throat> this medical miracle was especially impressive if you consider the size of the neurosurgery hospital, which only employed five full-time doctors. 
So you might ask, how did Dr. Shrestha find an, uh, find and access that critical article from India in the record timing? Well, his hospital is part of something called Research for Life. It's an initiative spearheaded by the World Health Organization, Elsevier, and four other publishers that brings free scientific research to Global South. Using this research tool, Dr. Shrestha was able to search for keywords in a database of more than 55,000 peer-reviewed journals, helping him quickly locate information when he needed the most. These are free access available to over 100 countries and immediate journal access allowed Dr. Shrestha to save this young man's life, quite literally providing research for life. Now, you might be wondering how this neurosurgeon in Nepal is related to this forum's theme of graduate education. And even though this story occurred in a hospital, not in a school, I believe it clearly shows the benefits that open science can bring to the global south not just to hospitals, but to governments, to nonprofits, as well as universities. In fact, Dr. Shrestha's story perfectly illustrates Elsevier's multi-tier definition of open science, which includes all strategies that foster a more inclusive, more collaborative, and more transparent world of research. See, at Elsevier, we loosely group open science methods into five major buckets, which are one, open access, which is a publishing model in which certain versions of articles are free to access online. Two, open data, which makes raw research data available for free to all researchers. Three, which is research integrity, making sure that all research is reproducible and adheres to ethical research standards. Number four, knowledge exchange, which is the movement of information between researchers and potential users of that information, which brings the benefit of science to the actual society. And finally, metrics, which is database performance statistics. While each strategy is important, it's really the combination of all these strategies that creates the best results. Just think of Dr. Shrestha. He clearly benefited from initiatives enabling free and low cost access to research. But his research was also facilitated by the strong research integrity of the Indian scientists, whose transparent reporting allowed Dr. Shrestha to reproduce their methodology. And a platform for knowledge exchange between India and Nepal helped them quickly access and utilize this material. <clears throat> Finally, as his team is currently drafting an article about their own successful procedure, he can use open access publishing models to help bring his research to medical communities throughout the global South. Because he works with Research for Life Country, Elsevier would automatically waive the standard article processing charge for free to open access publishing. So together, these open science strategies included Dr. Shrestha's hospital and the global sharing of scientific knowledge and sparked collaboration between his surgical team and created a much needed transparency around the success of similar operations in the past. And as this story implies, we also need to use a combination of open science strategies to help graduate students in the Global South succeed. And with that in mind, I'd like to now share a couple of brief examples of how we at Elsevier advance open science through our everyday work, not as a slogan, but as an everyday work. Let me first focus on the open data piece of open science. We at Elsevier fully supports open data and has developed a simple method for data sharing. Authors can upload their data set to our Mendeley data repository, which links a free copy of their data set to their published article. This, help, this helps each study we published be FAIR. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So how does open data help graduate students in the Global South? Well, it supports them by enabling the three qualities of open science ecosystem, inclusion, collaboration, and transparency. Through these data sets repositories, 
students in the Global South are included in accessing key data sets for their research projects, regardless of university budgets. This access facilitates greater collaboration, both within their own research teams and with other researchers all around the world. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, open data allows graduate students to benefit from greater research transparency. They can easily understand where a certain finding is coming from without any guesswork. To provide one more example of the ways in which Elsevier supports open science, let's turn to research integrity. Just as open data principles are built into our core products, research integrity is a foundational element of our everyday work. Without that, there is no trust. In fact, the very mission of academic publishers is to provide high quality peer reviewed articles and protect the accuracy and reliability of research. Beyond that, we also use strong anti-plagiarism plagiarism protocols and offer ethical trainings for free on our Researcher Academy platform. As you might have guessed, research integrity also helps graduate students in the Global South by fostering inclusion, collaboration, and transparency. And through our free training courses on Research Academy, researchers in the Global South can ensure their work meets the ethical standards required for inclusion in the highest quality journals. Our careful peer review and citation standards help encourage collaboration rather than copying so that graduate students can build off and respond to each other's work. And finally, ethical research ensures a transparent research process that generates reproducible papers. And this in turn will generate more trust in the research originating from the global south. Now, these are just only two examples of many, many activities that Elsevier incorporates into open science strategies into our daily work. But in order to truly maximize the benefits of open science, for the global south and beyond, publishers and other industry stakeholders must work to incorporate open access, open data, research integrity, knowledge exchange, and metrics into everything that we do. So I hope I've demonstrated that we must approach open science from a holistic angle to ensure that it has the desired effect on making the research world more inclusive, more collaborative, and transparent. And if we do this, I'm certain that the entire world, North, South, East, and West, will see the benefits. And thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you, Wes. I, I think your uh, speech has answered some of the questions, and also you give a very clear uh, picture of uh, what Elsewhere is doing on promoting uh, open science. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion uh, after the, the second uh, three speakers. And uh, now we are uh, we we go to another uh, open data facilitators, uh, Springer Nature, uh, and uh, with us today is uh, Dr. Niels Peter Thomas, uh, President for Springer Nature Greater China and uh, Managing Director Box. And uh, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, he will talk about facilitating digital inclusiveness for countries in Global South. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Young, and um, for having me here. Um, very happy to um, give you a perspective on the role of publishers for facilitating this digital inclusiveness. And I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion afterwards to, uh, for example, the questions that you have already asked um, Shamila ex ex explicitly for the for the publishers in here, and I'm very much looking forward to that. But let me first um, use my 10 minutes to give you some perspective on um, our understanding of our role, um, how to facilitate this inclusiveness. I won't go too much into detail 
um, about um, our company. I think it is it is clear um, as a global publisher um, what roles and principle we we have. We see um, as a the global mega trends, so to say, um, for publishing um, overall in the global world. Um, three big trends. One is almost accomplished. That is the trend print to digital. That was a prerequisite and a necessity um, to go more open access. Now we are in this very phase of um, transforming subscription to open access. And as a mission-driven or purpose-driven organization, this is really very close to our heart to facilitate this. And then we see another um, global trend um, that is certainly also shared with um, most of our competitors. It's um, um, going away from a pure content um, provider to more service provider also in the context of um, knowledge um, and, and research. But let's focus now on this open access part, um, which is really um, the important part and the focus uh, point for us here today. Um, this, this is now the convenient situation that I'm the second speaker from the publishing industry, so I don't have to go into detail anymore um, that, of course, um, publishing open access includes data, code, um, uh, preprints, protocols, and the final paper, the version of record. So we as well see this as a package. But I would like to focus on why we um, believe we can really um, also measure and really demonstrate why this is beneficial not only for the authors who publish in open access but also for science and for society and here i explicitly mean for the global society and um, not only for parts of the northern western or whoever um, um, however you want to classify it societies so it's very clear for us and we can see that in our um, in our data that an article or a book, we are publishing books and journal um, articles in this, in this context, that an article is significantly more downloaded, more cited, um, but also all kinds of other metrics, metrics more used and uh, a considerable amount of this usage and citations does come from the global south. And so we can really demonstrate that it is a good idea and that it really works. Um, roughly one third of our content that we are publishing is already um, published in an open access mode. And so um, every year there, is, there are really hundreds of thousands of articles that are added to this um, repository. But it's really, I truly believe, um, necessary for um, open science and open science as being more than just open access, really to um, unleash the potential for um, including everyone in the process of research um, and, and science. Um, and therefore, I think um, especially important for um, for the for the world and to address the world challenges um, that we want to facilitate. Now, I don't want to go too much into detail with this um, with this example here, but this is, I think, a very good example how collaboration between the complete research community as well as multiple global publishers worked really, really well in the last couple of years. Um, it's the, the case study of um, the reaction of um, um, universities, but also publishers um, on COVID-19. Um, Springer alone and many other publishers, including Elsevier, but many more um, as well. Um, we have published everything on this topic in open access from the very beginning. 24,000 articles only by us, 70 more thousand articles and book chapters we have made um, open access uh, to really let everyone participate in the research on it. Um, we have also made available um, multiple thousand preprint articles and I think it's very from my perspective, at least, very impressive how fast, for example, then um, all over the world um, vaccines could be developed. And I think it is um, one, one outcome of this um, collaboration between the universities, between the research sphere and the publishers. So we can really demonstrate we know that it works if we only work together. For us, I think, and this um, is really a new perspective that I would like to add to the discussion. For us, it's not only about um, making the, the one article available, which is always good. Every additional article that is um, published in open access is, is certainly helping here. 
But for us, it's also to go um, via transformative agreements to really scale faster, because otherwise it would take too long from our perspective um, to really um, get the whole world on an open access base. So this is why we are looking currently at um, changing um, countries where every researcher then has the same chance of publishing open access, but also reading all research all over the world. This is a trend that started certainly um, in Europe. Um, lots of European countries are already um, transformed with these transformative agreements since 2015 um, within Springer Nature and our, all of our content transformed to open access agreements. But uh, the importance here is that we are now shifting our focus and expand the transformative agreements also to the global south. So we have um, started the first ones in Africa and in Latin America. And I think it's a very good um, case study to demonstrate that um, transformative agreements is not only for the rich European countries um, that can um, really um, traditionally also afford um, the, the um, um, to pay for the subscriptions, but it is also something that is possible to organize in a sustainable way um, with um, these second tier um, countries um, of the Global South. And this is currently our focus to go more into, into this opportunity and, and start unleashing more potential also from both sides. So it's not only about letting the Global South read what the, the rest of the world has published, but we want them to be included also in the publication of open access articles, which is then um, probably the next step. To go there, it will certainly take a few more years to include everyone um, who needs to be included. And that is why I think in the meantime, but just as a temporary solution, so to say, um, we have installed um, a couple of um, different waiver and discount policies to really make sure that um, funding and um, um, uh, APC payment must not be a barrier for the poorest of countries. Um, so it, there is a possibility for researchers in um, countries with um, lower funding possibilities to also publish in all of our um, uh, in all of our journals, no matter which um, impact factor they have, simply because we have this um, APC waiver and discount policy. We are also supporting Research for Life. Um, thank you for mentioning it and and um, giving the case study here. Um, we are one of the participating um, publishers here, and and we really believe that this is um, something very, very meaningful as, as it was um, powerfully demonstrated just a few minutes ago. Before I come to the end, I would like to um, just focus on one more aspect um, that hasn't been mentioned um, in detail yet in our discussion, but I think it's very much linked to it. And this is the focus on SDGs, on the sustainable development goals um, uh, defined by, by the UN, because Springer Nature is also supporting them very much. I'm, I'm very um, proud to say that already every fourth book that we are publishing has a very strong SDG focus already, and we are really trying to facilitate and encourage more researchers to publish in these areas. Um, and we are able to improve and to grow the number of SDG related publishing, uh, publish um, uh, articles and um, book chapters from year to year. There are three um, SDGs that we have selected as a company to be our focus SDGs. One is number four, quality education. One is number 13, climate action. Um, not many people are speaking about climate action in the last couple of years because the world seemed to have more pressing problems right now, but I think it's still a very, very important one. So this is also what we have selected and number 17, partnership for the goals. And I think especially quality education number four and um, the partnership for the goals 17 are very much in the center of the topic for today. Um, and that's why I believe that um, this should go really hand in hand, um, the focus on open access and open science, but also focus on the SDG. I would like to stop here in the interest of time, but um, then again, very much looking forward to the discussion. lecture and also answer many of our uh, questions. We'll have further questions to ask you during the uh, uh, discussion uh, period. Now we come to our final uh, speaker, uh, is Professor Jie Chiao.
and uh, she is the president of China Association of Women in Science and the Technology. And uh, so I, I have to say this side event is a collaborative effort by uh, over Open Science uh, Committee and this Women a Gender Equality Committee. So Professor Chow is the, uh, the head of that committee. And uh, she is from Peking University uh, in China. And beside the pro professorship and the senior vice president of uh, Peking University, uh, Jie Chow is also a renowned uh, obstetrician. Actually, her team brought to the birth of my grandson. <laughs> and also today is the uh, anniversary day of Peking University. That is, uh, so it's a, uh, uh, and it's also called the Youth Day of China. That's because of her university. And she will speak on gender equality in graduate education and the professional cultivation. Please. Professor Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Yang. And distinguished guests and friends, Nice to see you all. It's a great honor to attend the STI uh, forum. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation uh, the five speaker already gave. I'm the last speaker today. The content I share with you is gender equality in graduation education and the professional culture. Um, yeah, what's it? Okay. Uh, in fact, the two key words in this uh, side meeting are education and uh, uh, equality, which uh, in this principal part of the United Nations sustainable development goals and important symbols to measure the uh, progress and social uh, civilization. Uh, with the development of society, gender equality in tertiary education, including undergraduate and graduate programs, has improved greatly. According to United Nations estimate, during the past 30 years, gender disparity in tertiary education has shifted from male to female uh, advantage in the world. The global level of um, female enrollment in tertiary education is 41% uh, in uh, 2020. And uh, in China, the opportunity uh, for women to receive graduate education has increased from uh, in 2001 uh, and proportion of uh, female doctoral students in school increased from uh, 39% to 42%. Up to 2021, the total number of uh, female masters and doctors uh, in school has exceeded uh, 1.7 million. This data showed that in China, women and their families are more and more aware of the importance of receiving higher education to prepare for becoming excellent female scientific and uh, technological talent. Uh, and we also know that among the 1.7 million female graduate uh, uh, students, there are more than uh, twenty one percent um, received uh, education, and the Peking University uh, Health Science Center uh, that I belong to uh, now is the first uh, medical school of Western medicine funded by the Chinese government in uh, nineteen twelve. 
110 years ago. Um, uh, as the leader of medical college in China, PKUHSC is a, a well-structured uh, comprehensive medical college with about uh, uh, 14,000 staff, 10,000 students, 184 uh, including 10 university affiliate hospitals and 15 uh, teaching hospitals. Uh, at uh, present, female account for more than 60% of graduate schools uh, as a graduate students uh, uh, in uh, our center. Uh, the proportion of female uh, graduate is higher than that of male graduates. Uh, whether from the perspective of uh, discipline or training level. And in the process of uh, cultivating female medical graduates, we have already provided balanced and uh, equal teaching resource and environment. Uh, we have show care for female graduates in details and whatever uh, we can consider from the perspective of management. Uh, for example, the graduate uh, physical education, more uh, quantity and uh, appropriate class uh, are provided. And during the pregnancy of female graduates, they are sufficient, um, um, uh, there, is, there are uh, sufficient support to help them deal with uh, learning and childbirth. At the same time, outstanding female uh, alumni uh, also set example for female graduate students' self-development in here. Like uh, Professor Yan Renying, uh, she is the mother of uh, uh, perinatal health care in China. And uh, also like uh, Professor Zhang, uh, she is my, my supervisor's supervisor. Uh, uh, she is the mother of uh, uh, test tube baby in China, Melon. And also to you, you, uh, you all know uh, she got the Nobel Prize. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, uh, good, they have uh, devoted themselves uh, to talent training, scientific research and social service and has uh, brought practice uh, uh, benefits to the whole China and even the world. Uh, they took a practical action to show the female graduates, uh, graduate students more possibility for their future development. And uh, also under the guidance of uh, uh, pre uh, uh female medical students have grown uh, into uh, graduate uh, tutors like me. And uh, uh, now in uh, PKU HSC, 40% uh, of uh, graduate students uh, are supervised by female professors, accounting uh, for nearly 45% uh, of all supervisors. Uh, in the past eight years, the proportion of supervisors of doctoral candidates uh, has uh, significantly uh, increased. And uh, also many, um, uh, many uh, uh, who when the uh, graduate teaching excellent award of PKU, uh, uh, more than uh, half uh, this uh, past three years. And you can see more and more female professors have developed their uh, capability in teaching and scientific research to a high level. Uh, they play an uh, uh, exemplary role and trigger a positive cycle in the uh, cultivation of the female graduate students. And at the same time, PKU uh, Health Science Center is a play a leading and a driving role. And we provide a national wide continual education opportunity for a professional women in the healthcare uh, field. And we also play, uh, pay special attention 
uh, to enhance high quality cooperation of graduate education among developing country. And now in PKU HSC, uh, there are 36% uh, graduate students from developing country are female. Uh, they are major in the clinical medicine, public health, and uh, stomatology, which are the best project of PKU. Our uh, executive master of public health program also recruit uh, uh, city students from uh, Africa, supported by the China uh, Africa Friendship Award, among them 11 uh, female students. And in uh, uh, 2017, we set up the first overseas research and teaching based in uh, Malawi, focused on maternal and child health, uh, infection, disease, and uh, health uh, policy. Uh, in order to expand the cooperation with developing country, uh, PKU HSC established uh, China uh, as an university uh, consultant on medicine and health which uh, consisted uh, uh, 43 members from uh, 11 countries, most of uh, uh, which are developing countries. And through this uh, platform, joint training, joint degree program students and faculty exchange can be conducted at a bilateral and uh, multilateral level. During this uh, procedure, precise uh, some key issue about uh, gender equity uh, stress. So uh, when uh, reflecting on how to enhance high quality cooperation for graduate education among developing countries where we uh, focus on gender equity, making best use of uh, uni university cooperation platform may be uh, an uh, appropriate uh, approach. And uh, however, we also need to recognize that gender equity in uh, education, especially in the professional culture, still has a long way to go, uh, considering that a woman's career development to be a professional talent has always be limited by themselves, families, uh, social uh, pride, prejudice, and uh, other factors. Uh, first of all, we need to know uh, that there is a large regional uh, disparity about uh, gender equity in uh, tertiary education worldwide. This uh, proportion uh, you can see in the North America and Europe is uh, more than 80% nearly. However, in developing countries, it's less than 30s or even 8% in uh, Sub-Sahara uh, Africa. And when we uh, focus on special, uh, um, uh, specialized uh, subject, we can see around the, the world, uh, more women are studying in on education, health, art, and social science, uh, social science than men. But the proportion of women studying in IT and engineer is less than 30. And moreover, uh, among the teachers and professions uh, in tertiary education, uh, women uh, account for uh, forty-three percent, but the proportion of female researchers in the academic field is only thirty percent. In a com competitive uh, talent program, take the young. Uh, talent promotion project from China Association from Science and uh, Technology. For example, there are abuse uh, male and region uh, advantage. And uh, gender disparity is also persistent in uh, academic public publishment, especially in top journals. Uh, in five top journal, uh, top medical journals, the number of women as the first uh, authors is far less than men, and the number of women as the last authors or senior authors is uh, further less, only about uh, eighteen uh, percent. And otherwise, uh, women are underrepresented uh, and undervalued in poor and decision making. Only twenty-eight percent of uh, 
managerial position were held by um, a woman at the same time. More women are employed in the junior management than in the senior or middle management. Also, we should notice that the data from the global uh, south are limited. The data and evidence from developing countries is limited or poor uh, quality. And so uh, when we are talking gender uh, equality in education, we also should focus on other broader uh, contexts uh, beyond education, such as uh, uh, women empowerment, uh, social environments, uh, legislation, and the uh, location of social resource on women's education and other development field. All of these things are working together uh, to uh, help us uh, achieving the aim of eliminating gender discrimination uh, in the world. Uh, at the uh, at this point, there was some uh, uh, practice from China Association uh, for Science and Technology. It uh, uh, like it uh, relaxed the age for female scientific and technological talents. Uh, and also there is a, a policy encourage more women scientists uh, uh, to participate in uh, featured events. Uh, and China Association of Women in Science and Technology support female talents to play a great role in uh, scientific innovation. So in the end, I want to emphasize the gender uh, equality in education as for everybody, uh, women's high education, benefits for themselves, uh, their family, uh, our next generation, and thereby will promote uh, sustainable development in the whole uh, society. And thank you for uh, attention. Thank you very much uh, for Professor Chao Jie for your well prepared uh, PowerPoint presentation, gave us a lot of data on the uh, current statistics on the gender uh, balance, which in, in your university, in your hospital, and in the higher education in China, and also uh, in uh, a lot of uh, figures, uh, digit, digital figures in the world. So now we, we move to the, the final uh, discussion uh, period. Uh, before that, uh, I would like first to ask uh, to, to transfer one question from our uh, audience, uh, Professor Jiang Richard Shuk to uh, Professor Lian Zhenghe. Uh, professor Lian Zhenghe, she is also an English professor. So the question is, uh, the recent rise of China in science is closely tied to 40 years of teaching English, expanding publications in English, etc. This has been a massive effort. Can other countries afford, uh, afford to accelerate English education? Okay. <laughs> Very brief, please. Okay, yes, I'm going to be brief. So I'm not going to say whether other countries can afford, but I just want to say from personal experience how China has actually managed to do this. So I think here, the only key word that I would emphasize is the word motivation. And by motivation, I mean actually intrinsic and extrinsic. So intrinsic motivation, it's true that the English language teaching, the search in the English language teaching is a result of China's open to the outside world. And so people would like to communicate. They want to communicate with the native speaker, with the people outside China, and also they want to read more. And the most of the publications, of course, in English. So if their English is good, then of course they have a better chances of uh, you know collaborating or working with their international partners. But then I would also say policy really matters. And because in China, the language teaching is embedded in all curriculum at all educational stages. And it's also a prerequisite for matriculation into colleges. So this is really the extrinsic motivation. But then I would say that this search in foreign language teaching and learning actually gives us a lot of data for researching applied linguistics. 
And recently, we can see a huge number of uh, articles published by Ch written by Chinese scholars in the field of linguistics and applied linguistics, particularly pertaining to the Chinese context of language learning, teaching, and assessment. So to some extent, I would say that this surge really has led to a great increase in the research field, increase our vis visibility in the research arena as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Thomas, Niels Peter Thomas. The first question is raised from the audience, from uh, Dr. Shui Yan. And he asked the question is, uh, Niels Peter Thomas has both roles of president for Springer Nature Greater China and Springer Nature's managing director both. Has Springer Nature published any textbooks, especially any open access textbooks for graduate education in developing countries? Or a Springer Nature will have these kinds of projects? So this is the question raised from the audience. And uh, my question is uh, related, is, uh, is that uh, how can a graduate student in Global South can get free of low price textbooks or reference books which are necessary for their education with the help of open science? Uh, Niels, could you? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry, had to um, unmute myself. Thank you for the for the two questions. Well, to the to the first one from the audience, um, th we do publish also open access books, and we also have open access textbooks here. We don't publish textbooks specifically designed towards a global South audience. I believe in the global in in global science, so this is why our um, books should be should be able to be used universally. But um, we have published so far 1,500 um, books. So of course, quite obviously, open access for books is a concept that is um, not as widely accepted as for journal articles. It's also a funding issue, but also there are a couple of other um, copyright issues and so on. But um, we will certainly grow and accelerate that. So I'm very happy to, to say that we will continue to publish um, open access titles also um, in, in, in textbooks. And in, in addition to that, um, we have in the last couple of years also at multiple times um, for a temporary um, situation opened up our um, repository of textbooks to universities, for example, in 2020, um, in, in the first phase of lockdown after um, the COVID pandemic, we opened up all of our um, textbooks um, to all of our customers and, well, basically to all universities, uh, made them um, uh, freely available for a limited period of time because of the um, difficulty um, with, a, with a focus on textbooks, on, um, on um, the sciences and on um, life sciences. So I think there are these two initiatives that we're doing. Um, first, publish more of these titles, not only journal articles, but also books. They have a slightly different target audience, for example, typically not only um, aimed at researchers, but also at, at students, um, which um, why I think it is important and also to temporarily help out in, in times of crisis. So that's what we particularly do in this, um, in this context. And then to the question, how can um, how can a researcher um, get access to them? So um, I think basically, and and this is maybe something tying into what um, Jung Suk um, earlier said with the example for um, in research for life. I think I, I fully I fully agree there what you, what you earlier said that this findability um, I think is is really discoverability is is a key um, concept here. We need to be um, we need to make our activities and our um, publications also um, better findable for everyone, uh, because I think there are a great lot of resources already out there. Um, 
maybe if I if I may take the liberty here at least partially to answer also Shamila's question, we are offering trainings um, in language, we are offering support. Um, we do that already, but sometimes it does not find its um, meant target audience. And I think this matching together, I think, is a is a is a um, is an activity that we can solve by talking more um, to each other, like in this forum, but also um, to make it um, digitally better accessible and findable. Uh, thank you, Anil. I have a, a similar uh, question for Jung Sok. That is, thank you for sharing us best practices and the good wealth of Elsevier for open science with a focus on countries in global south. Uh, my question is, how can a graduate student in global south, especially in uh, science and technology lagging countries, to get free access of OA resources if his or her university does not purchase the license for uh, the relevant uh, data resources. Is there any uh, public way to, to get the basic need of their uh, graduate education? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. And uh, I think the answer is already partially in, uh, you know, addressed when I mentioned Research for Life, as did Dr. Thomas. Research for Life is an initiative we took more than 20 years ago with WHO, and it is an amazing program where over 100 countries qualify. Um, you know, if your GDP per capita is below $3,000, you qualify, it, and institutions have to sign up. But we not only provide uh, material, but we also provide training that goes with it. And that now goes well beyond articles. We make all the data available, like Scopus. We make, you know, um, the uh, books available. We make all sets, all sets, uh, all kinds of data sets available. So I think it is available. The question is how much it is aware and how much people make the effort to sign up for these efforts, right? And so just touching on Dr. Shamila's passionate issues. Uh, but I'm disappointed that she points the fingers at the publishers of high quality journals. <laughs> I, I would uh, politely ask her to update herself about what really has been going on in the scientific world for the past two decades. I mean, you know, we work with former director generals of UNESCO like Koichiro Matsara and Irina Bukova for those years to make huge progress. First, access is free to many, if not most of the less resourced countries in Research for Life. Two, Publishing is based on quality. It's not based on charity. Publishers will not build trust if we publish non-quality papers. And that's exactly the opposite of what we should be advocating for the global south. Three, training has been conducted for over two decades by publishers, by universities, by UNESCO, by governments, by funding bodies. And so I think that we should not underestimate the amount of thousands, tens of thousands of hours that these volunteers have put in to train the Global South researchers. And finally, each of the most respected journals in the world do have articles from researchers in the South already and have been for a long time. They may not be the lead author, but they are definitely as a collaborator. And that's where it all starts. And I think that China is a shining example of this, where in the beginning, it wasn't the Chinese authors were the lead authors. They were collaborators and co-authors. And then over time, they were able to become lead authors with tremendous investment by the government and by the universities and themselves. And so I think that, I think that we should not underestimate the amount of resource that's available already. And besides, how many people who really want to read an article cannot access it? All you have to do is to write to the author and a copy is shared. That's not exactly a very difficult thing to do today. And that is a, has been a practice for the publishing world for decades, not a recent thing. We are meant to share. And the word publisher comes from the Latin word publicare. That means to share, to disseminate, to communicate. So I, I hope that uh, the audience will understand that this is not a, a thing about pointing fingers at one sector or the other. 
This is nothing but cooperative nature and certainly publishing world, especially Springer Nature and our, some of our, our uh, collaborators like Wiley and IOS, IOP and so on and so forth have been the partner to UNESCO and especially TWAS. I mean, I think that our, our executive director will know that very well. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I have uh, currently another question from the audience uh, to Professor Chao Jie. And uh, the question is, uh, what is your take on uh, giving higher importance to women's education when it comes to quality education? So is women education is connected with quality education? Or Can you answer this? Connected the uh, what? Uh, sorry. To show to the women education and the quality education are they related or different issues? Actually, I think uh, for the um, female uh, education, actually female have a um, uh, good ability, uh, like uh, in the open science. Uh, they have ability of the reading, talking, uh, even the experience uh, technology. Because uh, uh, the witness of uh, motherhood, uh, actually sometimes they have the advantage for that. So I think just for uh, control themselves, they need to increase the uh, confidence for themselves. And but but also for the society and the university uh, need to create the more uh, communication uh, platform for them that can increase the quality of the education for the female. So um, I think no uh, barrier for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can see uh, both uh, Shamila and the Roman has raised their hand. So who who will want to to say first, Shamila? Thank you, Ray. And uh, let me say that this has been a very stimulating discussion. So I've I've learned much, uh, especially from uh, Jung Suk and also from Niels Peter, from Xi, from uh, uh, Lian Jian. It, it's been great great to listen to you. And, and let me first say to Jung Suk that uh, we at UNESCO greatly appreciate Springer Nature and, and Elsevier. These are laudable journals in terms of quality of the science. It's brilliant coming from my own background. I can reassure you that, but also on behalf of UNESCO. Maybe my appeal here today is beyond Springer Nature and Elsevier. I'm calling upon others to follow suit in the excellent examples you are laying for scientific publishing. We definitely must not compromise scientific rigor, certainly not. And it's laudable that you give a chance also to developing countries, a partnership with China and especially with TWAS. So uh, my sincere congratulations to you and please do not take this personally. I'm calling upon others to follow in your footsteps. That was my appeal here today for, for others who are also online. I, I just would like to say that I think it's it's very interesting to see these presentations from uh, Springer uh, Nature and from Elsevier and the focus on three of the SDGs. Now, we are facing the biggest battles in humanity today with respect to impact of climate change on biodiversity loss and water. 2.2 billion people still don't have access to water technology to purify their water. And this is the year of groundwater, making the invisible visible. We have a wealth of information at UNESCO and we are promoting what is called the technology transfer mechanisms. I think accessing technologies, uh, water science technologies, so that we could build a water secure world is also important. So SDG six, if we can't develop, build and deliver on SDG six, we'll not have any of the SDGs. Water is the connector, every drop counts. So maybe putting forward also some papers or water science technologies to, to facilitate the global south to access these technologies would be very critical to build a water secure world. And I think 
Well, I would appeal here also for technologies concerning biodiversity conservation, preservation, and hence my appeal for what is called the technology transition mechanisms. All your publications will enable countries to move into the technology transition so that they can deliver on all of the SDGs. SDI is critical for all of them. So thank you very much and brilliant work, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for your patience. Thanks to all the distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Romain? Uh, thank you very much. I think um, um, Shamila just you know, uh, mentioned it, though. It's not really a charity, but you cannot explain why in, in Sub-Saharan Af in Africa, you have only 3.53% of the global publication. It does not mean that all those hundreds of all those scientists in, in Africa cannot really have good publications. Um, the issue related to scientific writing, those skills may be different of, I may be a good mathematician in, in West Africa speaking French and being able to, to write my paper in English because sometimes also the language is very important. So paying attention to that is very important. We cannot continue. Uh, the 2000, uh, 2015 UNESCO Science Report, uh, even the 2010 and the 2000 and 2021 show that trend. So it is important to pay, to pay attention to that. Um, the research life, the one that you was mentioned also, is important. These papers, these are uh, repository exist, but we have the challenges, of course, of connectivity uh, in the developing world. Uh, yes, of course, if you want to have access to a to 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 um, uh, to an author, you may be able to have to have it, but it can be very cumbersome for somebody from Burundi, from Benin, from from Nepal. This is the day-to-day the -day reality that people people live. So I would like to really um, the issue mentioned by Shamira to be to you know pay attention attention to that. I know that uh, Elsevier has created a journal for uh, for Africa and that is something that is maybe very important. Sometimes you can focus some journal in, in a particular region so that may may be able to raise this capacity to uh, uh, to publish. There is something that I call a uh, uh, frozen knowledge. These people from from the global south, the least developed countries, science technology in country, they do science every day, but their paper don't appear uh, in the in the in the journals because of the issue of collaboration. Sometimes it's not easy. So there are many other barrier to having your paper in the journal than the quality, and we need to pay attention to that. So inclusiveness is very important. Um, uh, diversity is important. So we, we need to pay attention, uh, attention to that. Yeah. So I also see uh, uh, Niels raise uh, his hand. So uh, be brave. We are already 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yes, I will, I will be. I will be very brave. Thank you very much. Maybe just a very quick uh, response to what you said, uh, uh, Romain. Um, I, I fully agree. And I think um, the issue about language that you just mentioned is certainly an important one. And I very much hope that in the future it will be much easier to solve that with technology. So we've seen here great um, progress in automatic translation, um, both on the author side or on the publisher side. Um, so I think this is certainly something where technology can can um, can help a lot because I mean that is a problem that um, many countries have not only in the in the south but I I, I agree it's a particular um, um, burden there. Let's hope that um, that technology, which is cheaply available, really um, nowadays can really can really solve. Um, I wanted to also contribute. I mean, um, Jung Sook, you mentioned the, the the great example of China, and I just wanted to share one data point that it is possible within one generation to really change um, the way um, 
um, uh, this this goes. Um, because if I look at our um, most um, cited journal, Nature, uh, then if I look at the year 2000, 0.2% uh, of the authors of Nature were from China. Now it's 20%. Um, and this is just merely um, a little more than 20 years later. So um, within one generation um, of researchers, this can really turn around massively. And I think this could be a very encouraging, this should be a very encouraging um, um, case study for many other countries. Uh, it needs preparation. It needs, of course, um, long-term strategy as the Chinese have, have shown. But um, I think it's a very good example that it is possible and that it will be supported by the global communities. And it also needs collaboration. And there I also agree um, uh, with everyone uh, before me, not only between institutions like here, but also between researchers. I think um, this could be a very good strategy also for researchers in the South to collaborate more with researchers in other countries to really jointly have more momentum. Um, I think that could be a, really a, a way forward. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we sincerely thank for six speakers for their excellent and insightful talks and their answering of questions. We also thank for the stimulating discussions between our participants uh, and the, the panelists. Uh, I can see we have over 1,000 uh, people, uh, over 2,000 people, okay, to attend uh, this uh, side events. And uh, open science now come to the center stage of global development of science, technology, and innovation. The countries in the global south should become more active in this area. The economical, societal, and scientific development in the global south can be improved by quality graduate education, by the emphasis on gender equality, let us work together for this endeavor. Thank everyone for the participation on this site event. We'll report uh, the, uh, the summary of this site event to the United Nations SDI Forum. Now I announce this site event is closed and I hope everyone enjoys a better world in the future. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. 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 <laughs> Bye-bye. See you. Congratulations. Bye -bye. Thank you. Now online. Yeah. Bye -bye. Good evening, everyone.